at one end you have very few. I mean, you could count them on two hands. Maybe ten Christians who are spiritually mature and are going through their final phase of spiritual growth. Not all of whom will actually finish the course. Maybe three will finish. I mean, I'm not really sure of the probabilities yet. I, I, my pastor spent about 12 years trying to figure them out. And he never came up with what he felt was a, a good enough conclusion. But basically, it's working out to be like 1% of Christians actually get into the final phase of spiritual maturity. And then out of that 1%, um, maybe only one or two in a given generation will even finish the course. And I'm not even sure it's that high a percentage. Okay. That keeps the world going. That is the only reason why we're all on this planet today. That's the high end as far as the distribution of humans goes. And when you get into the final phase of the spiritual life in maturation especially if you are successful in it. Um, the tables turn on you and you become, um, as far as the world is concerned, incompetent. That's because uh, some kind of disaster, health or otherwise, will happen to you. And the test, the final test, is like the cross where you're doing absolutely nothing, but you still keep believing. And those around you might not even be able to tell that that's what's going on because you might not be able to communicate with them. In other words, you have some kind of illness where it's all internal and you're conscious, but nobody can really tell. Or if they can tell, you you know, your speech center is disturbed or something where you can't talk or write or something. There will be something to cut you off from those around you in such a manner as it looks as though God is abandoning you, punishing you in some way. Okay? That's for the people who are successful. The, the most highest, you know, the highest level of success. In between, well, let's go to the other end first. At the other end of the spectrum, the incompetence, the greatest degeneration in the human soul that occurs is due to anti-Semitism and every single Christian who turns negative to God will at some point become anti-Semitic um, although that's an opportunity for many to turn around and become positive to God again but pretty much every Christian who goes negative to God on a permanent basis becomes anti-Semitic toward the very end of their lives Anti-Semitism truly rots the brain. Okay? In a Christian, it, the degeneration can be swift or, or slow. It depends on how positive he is to God on other things. And really, it also depends on how lukewarm he is. Because lukewarmness, which is the, you know, 90% of Christians, and 90% of humanity for that matter, lukewarmness has two... The thing that's bad about it is also the thing that's good about it. If you're lukewarm to something, it means you're not really interested. And you just sort of pay attention to whatever the topics are enough to fit in. But you really don't care. you got something else that you're interested in. And so the bulk of the human race is lukewarm. Therefore, the, the extreme ends, the top and the bottom in this case don't attract their attention much they don't want to get into the topics much they just you know are looking to see what the masses vote and they sort of stay within the masses which satan very well knows and he, he that's his primary um tactic is to get everybody to want to mass together 
All right, that's what's behind his whole business with Israel. Is he wants people to mass to Israel, and he wants them to mass around Israel, and that's why he makes a big stink about Israel, so that the Jews will all start going there, so they'll be easier to kill. That's his big goal. Okay, and I explained that at length in the Lord Be Satan series, especially starting in uh, part three. But the point I'm trying to get at here is that the disinterest by the bulk of the human race in anything at all other than, you know, what they eat for supper. They're very parochial, nose to the ground, very much now. Okay, their interests are so low that it sort of shields them. This is the good thing about lukewarmness. It shields them from the fanaticism of the low. And, of course, they never grow up because they're so disinterested, they're not, they don't care about the high. That's evidenced by the Laodiceans. You know, the quintessential seven types of Christians um, is, is Revelation chapters 1 through 3. And, by and large, most Christians fall into the Laodicean category. And they get spewed out of the mouth of Christ at the end because they were lukewarm their whole life. Laodicea was a famous party town. It was famous for its uh, lukewarm water, which Romans would use, and people in those days all used, in order to throw up. You drank lukewarm water. It was an emetic. And so you could party more and eat more. They had what they called vomitoriums, where you either stuck a feather down your throat or you drank this Laodicean water. Maybe it tasted good going down. And then you'd throw up, so your stomach would be empty again. You'd go back and, and party more. That's what that's what a vomitorium was for. Um, so that's what the Laodicea, that's what Laodicea was for. It was situated between hot springs and then another place where they had truly cold water because the water in traveling would cool down. And by the time it got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm and therefore would make you throw up if you drank it. So the Laodiceans were, were glad handers. They were, you know, they're typical Christian. That's really what they were. You know, your typical Christian church has got, you know, the pastor stands at the back of the church or the front of the church after he's given you his 10 minute homily and he shakes everybody's hand and you say, what a great sermon that was, pastor, and you go home. You did your laundry chore for the Sunday. You nodded to God and now you go and do what you really want to do. That's your typical Christian. He goes to church because it's expected. He does everything because it's expected. And to him, what's right and wrong is solely based on what's expected by the masses. So Satan just manipulates the mass media to, to change the definition of what's expected. And then everybody's going to follow suit. Because they're not interested in the rightness or the wrongness or the correctness of an idea. They're only interested in fitting in. So they are competent with respect to whatever fits in. And there's a great need for things to fit in this world. You know, your car has to work. You know, they're very practical people. The lukewarm. They're very practical. So they're real good as, you know, the body slaves. To make the stuff that works so that your house works and your car works. And when you go to the store, you know, the lights work and all that kind of good stuff. Those people are only interested in that. Anything higher, higher questions are actually right and wrong, don't interest them. So that God uses that, their disinterest, to help the world run too. Because they are interested in certain things that are right, but, because, but not because it's right, but because it fits in. See, that's how come you could have a Hitler and a Germany. Because fitting in in those days was to follow what Hitler said. So it wasn't about how right it was, because Hitler was totally wrong. It was about whether you fit in by following whatever the prevailing current was. Okay, but if the prevailing current, to a certain extent, and this is right and true, well, you got to have a good house, you got to have a good car, you got to have food clothing so there's got to be some you know spend your competence on that that's right that you need to do that to a certain extent and they focus on that 
So they make good little slaves. And that's about all they'll ever be. But all it takes is a leader like a Hitler to redefine what constitutes expected. And they'll go right down the anti-Semitic path. But the anti-Semites themselves, who are that way by their own choice, their own beliefs, not because it's expected, they become truly incompetent. They are the most manipulated by Satan and company because Satan and company, that's an agenda to destroy the Jews. Okay? And those people who are under the sway like that are really at the end of their mental lives. They're already, you, you, if you're anti-Semitic, you're insane. You just, it's just a question of how much. And to a certain extent, your brain is disintegrating rapidly, and they have to do something to stave it off. But, you know, degeneration is like mold. It can be really thick in certain places, and just a few spores have spun out in other places. If you look at bread, bread tends to mold in pockets. Parts of the bread are real green, and then at the other end of the slice of bread, it's, you know, almost white, which you can't see the spores that are in there. Okay, but people will make the mistake of thinking there are no spores in there and, you know, chop off the part that's still white from the part that's green and eat the part that's white. And hopefully they're not allergic to the mold they just ate because they could die from that. Okay. But that's the way anti-Semitism is, too. It infects in pockets of people. And then those people are choosing to be anti-Semitic on their own. And anti-Semitism, like any other pathology, is going to be, you know, mild to severe. And that ends up causing the people in the middle, okay, to either react against the anti-Semitism they see, okay, or to go for it. In which case you have a degeneration in the middle group that are disinterested. Some of them peeling off toward the bottom. Eventually, anyone in his own lifetime is either going to be for God or against God by the end. And if he's against, he will peel off into anti-Semitism. That doesn't mean it's ever going to necessarily be very strong. But it will be there. America has a history of what you want to call... Um, respectable anti-Semitism. I mean, the stuff that happened in Germany would not have happened if America hadn't been so anti-Semitic. Okay? Well, Europe has long been anti-Semitic, so there's no hope there. Um, Middle East, of course, has always been anti-Semitic, so there's no hope there. There's a great deal of anti-Semitism in Asia, um, so there's no hope there. Um, Mexico, Latin America, there's a good deal of anti-Semitism there, but at the same time, there's been um, a lot of support for the Jews. Okay, a whole bunch of your higher Mexican families are actually Jewish in origin. So there's a certain amount of polarity there. Uh, it's kind of hard to characterize Latin America. But for sure, Europe has been anti-Semitic for a good 2,000 years. And um, the Middle East, of course. And in Asia, it's a little more, it's a little harder to classify. Um, it's, it's a little harder to classify. I, I, I couldn't break it down by region in Asia. Like, I, you know, India, anti Semitic, yes. Um, East Asia, in the islands like Indonesia, Thailand. Yeah, there's a high amount of anti-Semitism there. China, it's a little harder to classify. A certain amount. Japan, that's harder to classify. I don't know. Russia is obviously anti-Semitic, so... I don't know if you'd even want to classify Russia as Asian. to mix. But the point is, the anti-Semitism is, is satanic. 
It is therefore uh, very destructive and that the demons have to really work hard to keep a competence going in people who are anti-Semitic and they do but they can't manage everybody. It's very popular to be anti-Semitic and that's not all Satan's doing. People love to be jealous. If, Like I said at the beginning of the last increment, if you got a talent or an ability or a competence, especially one that is produced by Bible doctrine growing in you, people resent it. People resent people who have answers to questions. I don't know why. I mean, I love it when I don't know something and somebody else has the answer. It saves me time. But other people, they, they first look at the fact that you have an answer they don't have. <clears throat> and so therefore, you know, they resent the fact you've got it and they don't. Well, hello, you're giving them the answer, so they got it now. I mean, people who like to give answers, they like to give answers to save other people time. Because it costs time to get the answers. I mean, when somebody gives you a tip in Windows that saves you time, aren't you grateful? A whole lot of people aren't grateful. They resent it. So, people can resent the Jews simply because they're more competent. In the case of the Jews, they're more competent for two reasons. First, it's part of the blessing to Abraham. That's Genesis 12, 15, 17. So it's genetic. Um, it's also bought by 400 years of training, and, you know, the body passes on in the genes things that it learned. There are physical things that, that you learned that you don't, they pass themselves off as talents. You think it's a talent, but it's not. It's in the genes. There are certain things in your genes that are the product of what people before you, whose bloodline is still in you, they learned. And that gets genetically passed on because their body functions. They're body-related. Body-related talents, body-related skills. They pass on. But pretty much all of, you know, 95% of what you are, okay, is a product of what all the people before you whose blood, whose DNA is running in your veins, okay, so to speak, really in your cells. 95% of you is that, but it's the 5% that's your volition that determines what you do with the other 95%. So 100% of it is your choice. So 100% of all the Christians who reject God will become anti-Semitic to some degree at some point. That will be usually in the final stage of their mental degeneration. And God might keep them alive for a long time. So you can't say that they just die soon after and depending upon their strategic value or tactical value to Satan and company, Satan and company will also try to keep them alive and competent. But in the vast middle, and this is kind of what ties the two ends together, um, you have people who are not interested enough in anything but their tea and baguette to even care about God and right and wrong. They only care about fitting in. Can they get their next RV? Can they get their next computer? Is somebody being nice to them? What dress do they wear to the party? They are wholly focused on today and the people in their immediate vicinity. And they'll slap God's name on things because that's expected. All right. But they really don't care. And so they end up being like what what God ends up using Satan too for that matter holding the world together because they just don't care enough to be involved in the bigger questions they'll mouth them if it's expected or it makes them feel important but it's five minutes and then they go back to their usual petty thinking alright that's the way the world is situated it's like a bell curve okay in the big lump in the middle, you have all the disinterested folks. Okay, and then at the two ends, you got the people who are really interested in God and in some kind of fashion are actually learning Him. And then you got the other end, the people who are just about to, you know, who are just, you know, what do you want to call it? Total loss. 
Now, the objective in letting those people at the bottom end live is that they might yet wake up and smell the coffee. There's the same reason why hell lasts forever. God knows that you're not going to wake up and smell the coffee. God knows that you're going to continue to be whatever you are. Okay, or he knows if you're going to change. But you can change, you can choose, and so long as you can choose, which is forever, you get another chance to choose. God never terminates your chances. They get harder. They get, um, what do you want to call it? Every choice you make, it's easier to make that same choice again the next time. So it gets harder and harder to make an antithetical choice the next time. But you still can do it. So these people at the bottom end who are anti-Semitic, all right, are mostly um, non-Christians. But most Christians eventually go in the same direction. The final stage of your mental degeneration, therefore, as a Christian, is to become anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism pervades Christianity. Okay? Preterism is held by all Catholics and all, almost all Calvinists. Not quite all. Those are two of the biggest denominations in Christendom. When I say Calvinists, I mean I'm in, including the Reformed. All right, who, you know, not everybody holds to all five points of Calvin. A lot of them are three-pointers or two-pointers or five-pointers. But the, but the whole reform group as a whole is pretty much uh, the substance of Protestant Christianity. Lutherans are not, you know, considered Calvinists, but they are also preterists. Okay. So, preterism occupies at least, in terms of formal allegiance, to a denomination, at least 50% of Christianity today. So it's anti-Semitic. All right. Very, very few Christians who are even in the group that believes that there's such a thing as a pre-trib rapture. Anybody who's not pre-trib rapture is totally anti-Semitic and doesn't even know and wouldn't consider himself anti-Semitic. But he's buying into a doctrine that cuts out the Jews, which is totally anti-biblical. All right, a lot of people who are, who are not pre-trib rapture um, do not consider themselves anti-Semitic, but are simply because they buy into anything. They you know they reject pre-trib rapture. That's why pre-trib rapture, surprisingly enough, is one of the few doctrines you really need to believe in in order to grow up in Christ. And that that's one of the biggest surprises that's happened to me in, you know, investigating all these doctrines and where they come from and what's right and what's wrong. That's one of the biggest surprises um, to me in the past 10 years. I didn't know it was that important to believe in pre rapture, okay? I was bored with it, as you've heard me say, and... I believed in it because, you know, here's the Bible, here's the Bible verses, they all make sense. Yeah, I understand that. It's really a promise to Christ. And, uh, you know, Israel was always supposed to be the vehicle for Christ. So that hasn't changed just because she rejected him. He's coming back and he's going to rule Israel. So this whole trib and the millennium and all that stuff is promised to him. And she's the beneficiary of his promise and so are we. That's the two walls in Ephesians 2. But, you know... I didn't think it was so important to spiritual growth, but it is. Because it's a promise to Christ, that's number one reason, through him to Israel, that's number two reason, and that ties back to Genesis 12, 15, 17. So if you want to have a miserable life and end up incompetent, become anti-Semitic. And you can become anti-Semitic merely by laughing at, disbelieving, not investigating the pre-trib rapture doctrine that starts in the Bible as a basis of how God orchestrates time in Genesis 5. It's a, you know, rapture is a sub-doctrine of how God orchestrates time. Which nobody in Christendom knows. Now, the Jews did know that. They talked about it. It's well known even on the internet today, even though it survives in garbled form. The Jews always said... 
2,000 years, it was really 2,100, 2,000 years to the Goyim, that was Adam to Abraham. Then 2,000 years for the Jews, that was Abraham to Christ. Then in current misguided Jewish thinking, it's 2,000 years for Messiah. Well, we're coming up on the end of the 2,000 years to Messiah, of Messiah. They, they think the third 2,000 years belongs to Messiah. And in their disbelief in Christ, they become incompetent too. So their calendar is off by 346 years. So they think that we're in year 5773. Okay, whereas in fact we're in year 61, what is it, 6119, something like that. What, what's the year that we're really in from Adam? And when I say from Adam, I mean Adam's fall, not from initial creation. We don't know when initial creation was. The Bible doesn't begin to date um, dates until Adam's fall. Um, we're in year... La, 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 la. Okay, 6113 was twenty. Uh, 2007, so six years from that, we're in 6119 from Adam's fall. That's our real year. But the Jews think it's 5773. So they're waiting for year 6000. They think Messiah will come then. Okay? That doctrine by the Jews has always been there in some form because it is based initially, and it's gotten garbled since, on the Bible. Okay? The Bible's using 1050, 1050, 1050 as civilization units. Two 1050s are 2100, and that's exactly the period of time from Adam's fall to Abraham, except Abraham matured 54 years early, and that's the origin of why Christ ended up coming when he did, is to pay back that extra 54 years. I covered that in my um, How God Orchestrates Time playlist. And in Yapping Most High in particular is most um, succinct on that subject. But the point I'm trying to make here is that it is about orchestrating time around the Jews because the Jews are the source of Christ physically. All right, That's why the Jews are important. So if you want to become miserable, then you know disregard the preacher of rapture. All right, and then that's anti-Semitism, and your degeneration will speed as a result. Your degeneration and your incompetence will speed as a result. Now, other people in the world, most notably the Muslims, are avowedly anti-Semitic. The PLO Charter is that Israel has no right to exist. That's Article 1 of the PLO Charter. And um, the world will, you know cater to anything that smacks of whatever puts down the Jews. All right, because it's Satan's world. That's his number one strategic goal, is anti-Semitism. The problem is, is that the more anti-Semitic you become, the more incompetent you become, the more quickly your brain degenerates. And so the Satan and company have to get real busy um, in trying to slow down that degeneration by you know, supernaturally aiding certain humans to be competent in certain areas. That's that's their big problem, is that anti-Semitism rots the brain. And as a Christian who rejects the pre-trib rapture, you will be a target to the extent that you matter to them. Um, but most likely, you're in the 90% of Christianity who just doesn't care one way or the other what the Bible doctrines actually are. You just want to fit in. You slap God's name on stuff. And if your family was Catholic, well, then you're Catholic. You have no idea what Catholicism even is or what Calvinism even is, but that's your family, so that's you. And you'll mouth off the doctrines you're taught to mouth off, and you'll be told and taught from age zero to age 18. You'll be put through this little you know, agenda that the church has. And after age 18, well, you can sort of forget about it. Just show up on Sunday, nod to God, and you've got your laundry drawer done. That's the bulk of humanity. But the anti-Semitism is still in there. So your mental abilities will never grow. And you'll just be a nice little slave and you, you know, get up in the morning at 6 o'clock and by 8 o'clock you're at the office sitting at your little desk 
or doing your little job. At 5 o'clock you go home and you get your tea and baguette and you sit in front of your 24 inch, 54 inch HD TV and you flip the remote and you talk to your wife and you talk to your kids and they play with their Xbox and you go on for this for like, you know, 20 years and then you count yourself wise and maybe you saved up for retirement and then you go on vacation for like 10 years and then all of a sudden you get cancer or a heart attack or something and why did God let this happen to me? Well, because your time is up. You did your little slave job, you proved uninterested all this time and the demons are done with you too. So now it's time you can of course, that's your opportunity to wake up and smell the coffee, which you won't do, and you'll die as ignorant as you the day you were born. Meanwhile, you did your little slave job, which kept the world going in another day, because there got to be slaves around to do something. And then you get to the judgment seat of Christ at the rapture that you never believed in, and you wake up and, oh, I wasted my life, uh-huh. So that's the pattern of this competence and competence thing, is you got the two ends. Somebody at the very high end is being so competent that God can afford to take it all away. And at the low end, you got the anti-Semites. And in the middle, you got all the disinterested people who are basically keeping the world running from day to day. Because they are doing some things that, you know, what you might call the laws of divine establishment. They're doing those things that are key to day-to-day -day operation of the world. And they do, you know, want to be competent in that. They do pay attention to that. And they really pretty much don't pay attention to anything else. So that's what the middle group is doing, which is the vast, you know, 90% of the human population. Not really interested in whatever religion their group espouses. Just interested in fitting in. And that's how human history basically goes. So what do you learn from this? What you learn from this is that you yourself have your own vertical relationship to God. That's really it. You will have, at times, or for a long time, depends, in your life, certain horizontal relationships with people that are long or short in duration, that are intimate or not in format. And really the job there is... You know, it's it's like extra to enjoy life with them. But the primary purpose is so that you can learn. We can't learn just sitting on an island in isolation all the time. There's a time for isolation. There's a time for being around other people. And in order to, you know, keep body and soul together, you got to be around other people doing some kind of job. All that is designed to train you in the vertical, really. And it can be really pleasant at times, and it is usually not. Even in an intimate relationship where you actually love somebody, you have an awful lot of time that is either boring or frustrating with that person. Because it's part of being human. It's frustrating to be human. It's frustrating to live here. It's frustrating to be so weak. It begs the question of, why did God make me this way? That's the idea. It's supposed to beg that question. Well, why did God make you this way? First of all, because he doesn't need you to have to, he doesn't need you for pet tricks. If he needed you to be better than you are in order to, you know, justify your existence, he'd have made you better. So he's not looking for that. And it doesn't matter how good or bad you are because you got a brain and he can train that brain and it's really the thinking in you that he cares about. Whatever else you've got, you can't, he, it doesn't do anything for him. So you don't feel bad about what you can't do. And if you have talents, well, honey, they don't help him either. So there's no point in getting all proud of what you can do. Just enjoy it like you would a good meal. You know, I have certain talents and abilities, and I enjoy them. And it's like a good meal. And I see other people with talents and abilities that are better than mine, and I enjoy it in those people. But that's like a good meal, too. Who doesn't enjoy watching a good movie? Okay, but the people in the movie have more talent to act in the movie or do the directing or do the film editing than I do. That's why they're doing it and I'm not. So why should I be jealous of them? No reason. But there are going to be people who look at what you got and they're going to be jealous. You got that to deal with in your life too. Everything's training in the vertical. And 
for the most part. The rest of it, the horizontal, is unpleasant. And sometimes pleasant. So the bottom line is that for all the horizontals of your life, none of it is going to last. None of it's important except to train you in seeing God better. That's 24-hour Bible class, whole thing. So then it's like you go to God and say, okay, well, should I watch TV or do an email? Should I go to the bathroom or should I eat? Which is going to help me see you better? Because there's a timing to everything, and that's the other point. God is letting all this stuff, that's what Romans 8, 28 is about. God is working everything together for good, using your positives, your negatives, the next guy's positives or negatives, even using the anti-Semites to train us all. See, the bad stuff, when it exists, is used to give you a lot of lessons. Like, what's the lesson you learn from the anti-Semite? Brain degeneration, how bad it is, so you know not to do it. If you're a preterist, which you don't know, most Catholics and Calvinists and Reform, they don't know Lutherans, they don't know that, you know, that their own denomination is anti-Semitic. By cutting out the Jew from history, they don't know that. KGV are totally anti-Semitic, even though they believe in the rapture, get that. JWs, SDA, all of them. Your typical person in those denominations does not know and does not intend to be anti-Semitic. Aha! So when he's exposed to anti-Semitism, it's a big wake-up call. And then if he does ever get out of being lukewarm and actually start to learn about his denomination, he realizes that his denomination is cutting the Jew out of history. And that's his big warning to get out of that denomination. But if there were no anti-Semites, you wouldn't be able to, like, connect the dots. The Muslims are obviously anti-Semitic. They're out to destroy Israel. PLO Charter, uh, number one article, Israel does not have a right to exist. That's what Article 1 in the PLO Charter says. Palestine Liberation Organization. And all the Arab countries subscribe to it. But they also have vested interest in keeping Israel around because they also want to kill other Arabs. Now, that's obvious. 9-11 is obvious. Well, what's anti-Semitism? Why be against the Jews? Yeah, that's the opportunity you have, is to look at that. And a whole bunch of people currently are still looking at it. And then you start to think about, well... I'm not against the Jews. A whole lot of people will say that, even though they're Catholic or Calvinist or Reformed or JW or SDA. Some of them will then wake up and start looking into the tenets of their own faith and they'll start to realize, because God's going to make sure they do, that their own faith is anti-Semitic at foundation. Catholicism is anti-Semitic at foundation. That's how it grew. That's how it became Catholicism. Okay? That's the same thing is true for the Reform, which is a branch of Catholicism. Allegedly protesting against popedom. Okay, but they set up their own popedoms. To both Protestantism... And Catholicism are really just two conflicting siblings with the same anti-Semitic foundation. So if you start looking into your denomination's tenets and you realize, you know, oh, wait a minute. The Jews have a future. Yeah, they do. Revelation's telling you so. By tribe. Revelation 7, which Origen rejected. Origen treated that as metaphorical. And J.W. is also treated as metaphorical. Catholicism thinks that the church is going to beat the devil. And Calvin thought that Calvin's group would beat the, the Catholic church. That it was his group, not the Catholic church, that was the triumphant one beating the devil in Revelation. They interpret the book of Revelation as allegorical too. 
Again, not all Calvinists. But the point is, is that you start to look at, you see the egregious side of a thing. And you start to think about all the related concepts to that, and God will help you do that. So that you can get out of your lukewarmness, and at the same time, get out of the eventual descent that lukewarmness encounters, or goes through, which is the descent into anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is basically where all Christians go who reject God. And you're rejecting God if you're rejecting his promise to the Jews. Because all promises to the Jews are sourced in Christ. Because Christ was to become a Jew. And he is one now, and he'll always be one. So, you reject the Jews, you're rejecting Christ. Now, it takes a while for the average brain to even be interested in that question. And it takes an even longer time to recognize how subtle Satan's plan is. You've seen the tribulational rapture, you know, the rapture kicking off the tribulation, in order to get you to be anti-Semitic when you don't even know that's what you are. So the bottom line here on competence and the distribution is that the middle... 90% of Christians and 100% of anybody non-Christian is is pretty much disinterested. Well, not 100%, 99% of non-Christians are disinterested in whatever religion they seem to belong to. They're just going along for the ride. Um, And at the very bottom, you have the virulent anti-Semites as a warning of where life is headed for you if you don't wake up and smell a coffee. So the anti-Semites who are just cockroaches, okay? That's what they are. And they're good for nothing. And they became that way of their own volition, so there's no talking to them. There's no way to save them. Okay? They have to go through their own negativity and the results of it, which are, which is extreme mental degeneration, to hopefully wake up and smell the coffee, which most of them, they won't. So the rest of us, is just like the story of Pharaoh and the Exodus, the rest of us sees what happens to them. And we learn from that. You know, people in my own family are anti-Semitic, and we learned early, I remember very early in my life, we learned early from their anti-Semitism what, how, how stupid it is. Okay? And the world in general has made, a lot, has, has, has made, you know, a sort of progress in learning the stupidity of anti-Semitism, and there's a great deal of pro-Israel sentiment today, even among people who aren't Christians. So the world has been learning from these cockroaches. So why not let the cockroaches live? That's the point. In the middle, you got the slave, the slave mentality, the, you know, nose to the ground. I'm getting my tea and baguette, so I'm happy. And on occasion, when the anti-Semitism goes too high, some of those people will go into it and they'll, you know, reap the consequences and they might wake up and smell the coffee and other people learn from that and they don't go into it they stay disinterested in everything else but they stay away from that part or at least try meanwhile the few brought picotas as Paul puts in Ephesians 1 12 keying that very word to the year that Constantine dies the few are getting developed in handfuls. Waved before the Lord. The sheaf that you waved at the beginning of the 50-day countdown to Pentecost, which was harvesting. They're growing too. And that's basically the distribution of the competence, the pattern of going from competence, from incompetence to competence, and from incompetence 
or at least disinterested competence, to incompetence. And all that's a major flux. Any human being at any point in time on this earth is somewhere along that bell curve. Most of us, like I said, are at that, in that big fat bump in the bell curve for most of our lives. And something will happen that you either turn on to God or you turn off. So you stop being just merely disinterested and you start being interested or you stop being merely disinterested and you start being hostile and hostility expresses itself in a variety of ways most of them passive so it's not obvious dismissiveness is a form of hostility um, and then the human race basically degenerates in, in mass based on the flux in the middle toward or against God. And you can look at the whole sweep of human history and, and measure it that way. When interest in God grows in the middle, then the history of the world improves. That's why we had the Industrial Revolution, for example. When disinterest in God turns to hostility, as it is now, you start to see a shift, okay, a, a very destructive shift in you know the, the the whole quality of life in the world okay there is a, a trend right now happening now even though it's pretty much typical for this time period there is a trend happening now of people becoming extremely rapidly incompetent in what they do now it's not universal it's never universal but there is a larger trend of hostility to God going on right now. And therefore the incompetence increases with it. So that, well, frankly, within 10 years or so we're going to be at war. And whether we wake up and smell the coffee or not, I don't know. But in about 10 years, we're looking at war. And this is why. It's the shifting of interest in God. 200 years ago, there was a huge interest in God all of a sudden. And so God taught it out. All the manuscripts we've been trying to find, all of a sudden, a whole bunch of scholars from every denomination, including Catholics and Calvinists especially, they all got together and they said, let's just get these manuscripts collated and you know together. Let's just find out what we got. And as a result, you and I got Bibles that we can just look up online in Greek and Hebrew. Even for free. But that trend is about, about 1850. Okay, so 1850-2050. It usually runs in 200 year cycles from what I can tell in history. So, that trend is ending. And the disinterest and the, you know, the desire to twist the Bible is really at an all time high. Because now we really got a Bible we can vet in our hands. And, you know. We're twisting it. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. Otherwise the Muslims wouldn't be so successful. And that's all going to lead to war. There is a polarization of interest in God that's taking place. And there is a polarization of hostility toward Israel that's taking place. And a whole bunch of people are going to mistake this for the end times. It's a cycle of history, actually. And it could end up being the rapture at any minute, but that's due to other factors, not due to the things you see on screen. But it is definitely a trend that's going on now, and it always leads to war. It leads to war because at God's end, it's time to clean house because there's too much anti-Semitism out there. And at Satan's end, he wants to try to use the anti-Semitism that he's caused to grow to wipe out the human race as much as possible, particularly the Jews, before the, dis the, 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 that, before the degeneration in thinking 
amongst the anti-Semites is so bad he can't even work with it anymore. So that's sort of the microcosm of historical trends in history. I, I, I wanted to point this out because all along when I'm talking about the trial, I'm not spending enough time on how it actually plays in a manner that you can turn on your TV and interpret what you're seeing. So that's what the purpose of this little side trip has been. Is I've already been talking about the principles, the goals, the trial arguments, both sides. We're now in the God is God arbitrary to have the standard of just learning to live on Bible versus going doing good deeds. And I wanted you to see the sort of panoramic view, or at least the tools of the panoramic view, of how your little life, learning and living on Bible, is part of this vast matrix of two sides trying to get the humans to learn lessons. Satan and company having its own lessons they want the humans to learn so they can manipulate them. God wanting us to learn lessons so we can see them. How this actually turns out and plays every single day on the you know big picture. And the big picture is, honey, we're going to war. Okay? That's where it's headed. And this is why it's headed. Because the anti-Semitism has been growing. Satan has been very successful at cultivating it. And he couldn't cultivate it if Christians weren't turning against God. And they're turning against God because they were interested 200 years ago. And then as inevitably happens, that was only that generation that was interested. And then the generation after them want to be the opposite of the generation before them. So they got disinterested. And the disinterest continued. And there are always a few who are interested in each generation, too. And because the disinterest has continued, anti-Semitism has grown as much as it has. And all you have to do is look at history from 1850 until now to see how much anti-Semitism has grown. I mean, that's where we got Hitler. And it wasn't just him. You got the pogroms of Russia starting in 1905. Well, actually, before that, 1870. Satan started cultivating anti-Semitism at the same time the Bible was being rolled out. Your positive volition in the Bible means you're going to be positive to the Jews. Because the Jews know the Hebrew. The Jews wrote the Hebrew. They wrote the Greek Bible too. So if you're positive to the Bible, you're positive to the Jews. If you're negative to the Bible, you're negative to the Jews. And you inevitably become negative to the Jews, even if you don't mean to, as a, what do you want to call it, side effect of being negative to the Bible. So what you're seeing from 1850 forward is that there were a group, a very sizable group, of people in the 1850s who were very interested in the Bible. And they had kids, and they had kids, and they had kids, and they had kids, and most of those kids turned negative. Enough of them stayed positive that we had all the advances, you know, in, in Bible preservation and textual criticism and all that that's happened through today. But most of the kids have turned negative. And as they turn negative, they turn more anti-Semitic. Because the Jews aren't important if the Bible's not important, you see? So we're heading to war. Not sure how it's going to stand, whether it's going to be the China-Japan thing, or it's going to be the Iran-Israel thing, or it's going to be something totally from some other corner. But all the alliances, just like before World War I, are forming right now. Behind the scenes. And in the next ten years, we're going to be going to war. Whether it starts in the Middle East, it will end up there. Whether that means the rapture is going to happen, I don't know. But chances are it won't. Okay, it depends on how many kings are developed. So, if you want to think about your personal life and how important it is, it's real important. More important than, it, than it's been in a long time. Each individual life, each person wanting to learn God, has a huge impact on history. And we're at a pivotal stage in history. My pastor spent 50 years trying to explain this, but I honestly couldn't put all the pieces together of what he was saying until the last 10 years. 
I get it now, and I'm trying to convey it to you, and hopefully I'm doing a decent enough job where God will use what I'm saying to turn on the light bulb, or just turn it on in your head using somebody else. You're really important now. Learn and live on Bible. If you want to do the best good deed there is, even on a human level, learn and live on Bible because anti-Semitism, honey, is rising like never before. And in 10 years, that's going to be the underpinning of why people go to war. And we will be at war, world war, within the next 10 years. Peace out.